Welcome to the In Vibe Live podcast with Amy Parker and Cheryl Dunn. By tuning in, you are joining a community that will inspire you to increase balance, wellness, and joy in your life. We'll offer expert information and insightful conversations to help us all on our journey to live more in vibe. For more information and articles, remember to also check out our website at invibelife.com. That's E-N-V-I-B-E-L-I-F-E.com. And we're grateful that you're here. Hi, welcome to Invibe Live Conversations with Amy Parker and Cheryl Dunn. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Ashwin Gowda. Welcome, Dr. Gowda. Hello, and hello. Nice to be here. Yep. It's good to have you because we are talking about uh, the most important topic that everyone seems to be asking Amy and I about is sleep. And Dr. Gowda is a sleep spe- specialist. So Dr. Gowda, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this? Okay, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, so I uh, have been practicing now. I'm a physician. I've been practicing for the past 18 years here in Austin. Um, I am uh, board certified both in sleep medicine and psychiatry. And uh, the, ki- the practice itself is dedicated pretty much to the diagnosis and management of those with uh, sleep disorders. Uh, my background, I trained, I did my psychiatry training at the Mayo Clinic in, uh, in Minnesota. I did a fellowship in sleep medicine in New York at, at the SUNY University. Uh, in Stony Brook, and uh, been in Austin since then, and uh, really enjoyed uh, providing care to to all of those in Austin who uh, aren't sleeping as well as they should be. So uh, that's well. I that's, feel like uh, that's a whole uh, lot of us right now. <laughs> uh, as of right now, uh, our current pandemic has definitely uh, definitely heightened the risk, uh, and we we are definitely seeing more and more uh, people with you know, particularly insomnia related to, uh, related to what's going on right now. So it is a big, but uh, yeah. Even mm-hmm. before that, do you have any general numbers or estimate of how much of the population suffers from some form of a sleep disorder? Sure. Yeah, I can get into that. Uh, so sleep disorders themselves, of course, pretty, uh, pretty common gross, you know, majority of people actually that have sleep disorders are undiagnosed uh, and we'll mm-hmm. get into that. Let's take insomnia alone. Uh, the estimate is that about 10% of the population has uh, what we call chronic insomnia. What is chronic insomnia? That's where you have difficulty either falling asleep, uh, staying asleep, or poor quality sleep at least three days a week uh, for three months. So that's kind of wow. the definition of chronic insomnia. Uh, and that's 10% of the population. Now, if you take individuals that have insomnia in general, beyond just, you know, acute insomnia triggered by various things that happen, uh, that is somewhere in the range of between 30 and 50% of the population at any single time. And I would only guess that as of right now, it's probably even higher than that. And that's only one sleep disorder. So that's just taking insomnia, which is by far one one of the most common sleep disorders. Um, and of course there are a host of other sleep disorders that, uh, we what can just you talk about say, you know. what would you what would you think is the most common sleep disorder? I know we hear the word sleep apnea thrown around and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. insomnia seems like one, but what do you see the most of? So mostly by far sleep apnea is the most common sleep disorder that we see in the practice. Mm-hmm. And and that's because sleep apnea has an impact on so many different aspects of our health. So the doctors I work with, you know, we know that untreated sleep apnea puts you at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. You're more likely to have a heart attack. You're more likely to have a stroke. You're more likely to have diabetes, hypertension. Um, And so that's, and, you know, with all the different groups of doctors that we work with, that's a big component. You're more likely to have depression. One in five people that have depression have sleep apnea. You're more likely to have an anxiety disorder. Um, so there is, uh, you know, you, you're more likely to have chronic pain. If you don't sleep well, your pain management is not as well. If you have an underlying pain disorder, so it, it extends to so many different facets of our health when you really don't sleep well and sleep apnea, of course, is just an extremely common sleep disorder. Uh, the estimate is that about 25 million Americans have sleep apnea. And here's the, 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 uh, the real kicker here, uh, 80 to 90% of those with it are undiagnosed 
in the U.S. today. Okay, so eighty to ninety percent. Yes, that's, yeah, that's huge. But yeah. clarify for me. I'm going to play really dumb here. Exactly yeah. what is sleep apnea, and how do you know if you have it or don't have it? Okay, yeah. So sleep apnea. The most common symptoms, of course, loud, loud snoring. Right. Snoring itself does not mean you have sleep apnea, but it is one of the most common symptoms of sleep apnea, right? Every husband and, has sleep apnea. <laughs> I know. That's, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, is, is my, my insomnia because of my sleep apnea. problems? Or, yeah, which one of us has the undiagnosed disorder? <laughs> yes. So there's actually, now that you, it's funny you mentioned that, there's actually a term for that. So the, the spouse that is sleeping next to the person that has sleep apnea and was snoring extremely loudly, uh, their sleep disturbance, they have done studies to show that their sleep disturbance in the spouse is just as bad as in the individual that has mm -hmm. the sleep disorder. Wow. So, uh, and they've used, they've used the term spousal arousal syndrome. Because there's <laughs> arousal. That could go in a lot of different directions. I, that's Let's I just keep it in this <laughs> lane. <laughs> But, but it, you know, really what it does is they've done studies looking at brain activity in the person that has a sleep disorder and they've taken and they've looked and the same in the spouse and their disruption in sleep is just as just as significant. So, you know, that's that's important. And, and, and I would say a good number of people that find us that come to our center that are not referred by a physician are it's usually from the wife. Right. Or the girlfriend or, you know, it's uh, you know, if you don't get this fixed you know, you're in the other bedroom already, you right. know, I, I can't do this anymore, you know, and so it's usually, and it takes years, it takes years before they show up. It's usually not immediate. Right. Um, and but, so you, yeah. have, you have a lot of different um, resources on your website at, um, tell us to the website address right now, TX. TX Sleep Medicine. So, so the yeah. name of the practice is Texas Sleep Medicine. Sleep Medicine. So TX Sleep Medicine. TX Sleep Medicine. Is, com. And we'll have that linked yeah. on the show notes for this podcast as well. Um, but you have some links that I, you know, suggest everyone go there where maybe you can um, look at some symptoms or not symptoms to tell how disrupted your sleep disturbances are in your yeah. life. And that's, I guess, one way to tell when maybe you need to go see a specialist. But tell our audience, what are some other ways to know? When do you know that your sleep disturbances have risen to a level where you need to seek professional help? Single most important is the quality of sleep, right? Sleep boils down to quality and quantity. If you're not waking up feeling rested, uh, you know, then that's usually a sign that you're probably not getting great quality sleep. If that's combined with difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep, then that further uh, highlights that there's likely something going on. Now, one thing that's difficult for most of us is that when we don't sleep well, you know, there's a, it's a gradual onset, right? It doesn't occur overnight. It occurs over months, if not years. And the human body is very adept at accommodating or acclimating to that level of uh, sleep deprivation. So a lot of people don't even know how poor their sleep is until they get it treated in a lot of ways. And then there, there's that kind of wow moment, like, oh, I this is what I should feel like. You know, they just attributed it to kids, to life, to, uh, you know, I have a million things I'm doing, you know, I don't have enough. So that's a whole nother topic we'll discuss, but sleep deprivation is also a very significant factor. But to address your question, it's all about how rested you feel uh, and how well you function during the day. If you need naps during the day, if you're having trouble focusing or concentrating during the day, yeah, there's obviously a lot of different causes for that, but sleep and the quality of that sleep is, is uh, really the most important. You know, it's interesting yeah. you said that. It made me think about the fact that I've never really thought of this before. Um, when you sort of talk to friends or family about how people are doing and they're not feeling great. They hardly ever bring poor sleep up as a symptom to a poor quality of life. However, the opposite is true. You know, we talk to a lot of people about wellness and what makes you healthy and feeling great and almost invariably good sleep, good quality of sleep is a component mm -hmm. of wellness. Or it's a reflection and, of what's going on. Yeah. People, you know. people who 
people do appreciate it. You know, people who have started getting good quality of sleep and see the change it's made in their life appreciate the impact of that. And so, yeah, I'm so glad we're here talking about this today because as you said, a majority of people are not seeking diagnoses or treatment for these issues. And it can be such a huge game changer. Or they think, oh, it's just this time in my life. It'll go away. I hear that all the time. And that's particularly more from women than anyone else, because women, you know, you have children. And then once you have children, you attribute a lot of your sleep issues or just how you feel to the children. And then the children grow up and they are now you're like, well, I have the time. They're older, but I still don't feel you know, rested or I still have some component of a you know, poor sleep. And then that's a lot of times when they come to seek uh, evaluation and treatment because they're just not feeling any better. And there are a lot of different sleep disorders uh, that can be factors that really depends on, of course, the history that that you get. Um, But uh, but yeah, that's a pretty common, common presentation as well. Um, You know, yeah, we were talking about sleep apnea and I, you know, that, you know, we just talked about one of the symptoms there. Right. We talked about snoring. Of course, the other main symptoms is, you know, witnessed apnea, you know, where the partner sees that interruption in breathing or maybe a shallow breathing pattern. Uh, Sometimes they'll see them actually stop breathing and they're shaking them to wake them up. Now that's a clear apneic episode. Um, Dry mouth, nasal congestion, morning headaches is a very common symptom of sleep apnea. Um, Night sweats can be a symptom of sleep apnea. So, you know, there there are different symptoms and of course there are different risk factors as well. Um, So those are all important to figure out. I didn't either. You know, so I have another question um, sure. is so some people will say when we're talking about sleep, oh, I only need five hours because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a particular ah. person. I, I sleep a lot. And if I could get nine hours every night, that's kind of my sweet spot. Nine hours is a lot of time. I feel like when I'm running a business, I'm running kids around, you know, all this kind of stuff. So nine hours doesn't always happen. But um, yeah. some people are like, oh, I don't need that. Is, so what do people need or not need? Or does that vary per person? So, well, what you just said, uh, it does vary by person. Um, the, so here's the thing. Here's a good way to look at it. Once you're an adult, right, say age 18, 20, okay, and until the day you die, the amount of sleep you need does not change. So oh. there is an individual variability. Like you might need nine hours. I need somewhere in the seven and a half hour range approximately. And, um, and that's it. And that's what you will always need. However, the, the quality of sleep does deteriorate. You know, this is a normal process of aging. And this is assuming you don't have any underlying sleep disorders. The quality of deep sleep, you're going to get less what we call delta sleep or slow wave sleep, which is, an, which is an extremely important stage of sleep. So that tends to diminish as we get older. The amount of REM sleep we have, which occupies about 20% of the night, that does not change over the course of, uh, over the course of time. So the idea is how can you increase that delta sleep? How can you do by far the biggest thing is exercise. Exercise is obviously good for a lot of reasons, but actually exercise helps maintain that delta sleep. Um, Now, of course, there's certain medications out there which we use to treat other sleep disorders which can increase delta sleep, but speaking naturally and what you wanna do is is exercise. You know, cardiovascular exercise is by far the biggest uh, booster of this delta or slow wave sleep that we get. Can um, exercising too late in the day disturb your sleep? It can. It can. Uh, doesn't happen for everybody. But once you exercise, the important thing to remember is that your metabolic activity goes up. So your heart rate goes up, your sympathetic activity goes up, your blood pressure goes up. It takes the body sometimes hours for all of that to calm down, right? For some of us, depending on how strenuous the exercise is, if you're you know, if you just run, you know, five, six, seven miles, that's pretty strenuous exercise. It's going to take you longer than a 20 minute, you know, workout on your elliptical machine. So um, exercising, if, if someone's complaining of insomnia and they go to, you know, the most common presentation I get is someone who's like, I can't fall asleep. I come home from work or I go straight to the gym after work. 
and then they work out or they work out even later and then they have no they just they just they're not giving themselves enough time to let their bodies you know uh, settle settle back down and bring all those vital signs back to back to baseline so um yeah so i think a common conversation amongst women mm-hmm. is yeah. the 3 a.m wake up and it's for everybody 3 a.m what yeah. is, i mean is that what you hear too we do hear it quite a bit. Yes. Uh, you know, that has to do with just, you know, difficulty staying asleep, right? You wake up, you can't get back to bed. Very common. Number one cause likely it's anxiety. It's, mu- it's, it's just not being able to turn your brain off. If you wake up and the first thing you start thinking about is what do I got to do today? What, what happened with this? What happened with that? That's, you know, that's going to keep you up. Now, There are, of course, underlying sleep disorders, right? Underlying, like we talked about earlier, sleep apnea. There's another condition called periodic limb movement disorder where your legs jerk at night, and that can wake you up. Now, it doesn't have to be 3 a.m., but and that can happen at any time of night. But those are very common reasons you wake up. Now, the question is, what do you do when you wake up at 3 o'clock, right? And what do, well, what do you do when you wake up at 3? If you do wake up at 3 o'clock, what do you do when you wake up at that time? I will grab my phone and play solitaire. Ah, I knew the answer. I already knew the answer. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, well, why is that bad? Well, a few different things, right? It's light. Now you have a device that's emitting light in darkness. And what does that do? Well, light travels through your eyes, goes to your brain and the brain stem. And it says, well, it's time to wake up, right? It's You're telling your brain it's time to wake up. Light is the single biggest cue that regulates our circadian rhythm and our ability to sleep, right? So using, and, and, to, and on top of that, if you're focused on something, then you're even more likely to be a, 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 you know, awake and have difficulty falling asleep. What is the other thing people do? They lay in bed, right? Mm-hmm. You're hoping and hoping and hoping that you're going to fall back asleep. Guess what? That is the wrong thing to do, right? The best thing to do when you're not sleeping if you lay there, what's going to happen? You're going to get more anxious. You're going to think about it even more. You're going to be, why am I not able to fall back asleep? Oh, well, this is happening now. I've, and now, in fact, the insomnia gets worse. And there's actually a term for that. We call that, the medical term for that is psychophysiologic insomnia. What that means simply is a long word for, what that means is really that you have created an environment in your bed that is not conducive to good sleep, Right. Re, uh, watching TV. I mean, this applies to everything. Watching TV in bed, uh, playing on your, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, if you don't have a sleep disturbance, then maybe it's okay to watch a little TV in bed. But if you're already having trouble, that's like the wrong thing to do. And uh, then the other, so the, what you should do, what you should do is you should get up, leave the bedroom, right? If you can't fall asleep, give yourself maybe 10 minutes. If you're like, I just can't sleep. Usually what I'll tell people is go, go get out of the room. Go get a glass of water. Don't turn on all the lights. Maybe just go sit, go sit on the couch for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you know, if you can use some dim light, maybe uh, a book or something that's not particularly engaging or a magazine you can kind of flip through. Once you start feeling that sense of calm and assuming you do feel that sense of calm, then you get up and you go and you try, lay down again and you attempt to sleep in bed again. If in another 10 to 15 minutes you don't fall asleep, you do the same thing again. The worst thing you can do is just lay in bed when you're not sleeping. That is all, that's the vicious cycle. That's the cycle Mm -hmm. that it just feeds itself. And then, and it, and it becomes, once it becomes chronic, it actually becomes much more difficult to treat. So um, the idea is you got to get out of bed. So that's the one part of, yeah. yeah. That's great. That is great information because I always, uh, I'm a little type A, so I would lay there too if I wasn't playing solitaire because I know it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would lay yeah. there and kind of try and will myself to sleep. Like you can do this, count backwards, now, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's why it's such a common, that's just a misconception. That is, that's everybody. I mean, that's almost everybody we see that that's their attitude. You know, their per- perception is if I just lay there somehow, I'm going to fall back asleep. And I get it, you know, get it, but that's really not the, not the best thing to do at all. So, And just to go back into what you were saying about light, light turns the brain on. Mm-hmm. 
is there a difference between different kinds of light, like the light that's emitted from our devices versus, of course, the sunlight, but even maybe our light bulbs in our house? Yes, that, that is so true. That's a great question. So blue light, you know, you've all heard of blue light, right? So blue light, all light has different wavelengths. And blue light has been shown to produce the greatest impact in terms of impacting all, our alertness and our, uh, our circadian rhythm. So our circadian rhythm is what ultimately regulates when we go to bed, when we wake up, when we're, when we're functional, when we're not. So that circadian rhythm is important. So blue light is the most important. Two things you can do to help with that. Um, mm -hmm. You've probably seen blue blocking glasses that you can buy. Yeah. It has like a yellow tinge on it. It blocks blue light. Um, that's one part of it. Now, it's also important to remember that but light in general still has a negative impact on sleep. So for a lot of, you know, students that we see or in school that are studying late at night, you know, they have to study. So what do you tell them? Well, if you're on a laptop, you're on a computer, dim the light, uh, you know, do the best you can. Um, turn the lights down in the room. If you can get some blue blocking glasses, uh, do that. So anything you can do to minimize that light exposure um, is, is going to be helpful, but, but specifically blue blocking blue light is going to be the most important aspect of that. So, and that's why like a lot of phones now come with the night mode. Right. And, and so that's what they actually do. They block that wavelength of light. They're not perfect at doing that, but it's, it's better than nothing. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good to know. When when Zoom life kind of started for our kids, I bought them both of my children those blue blue light glasses. Oh, good, great. I, yeah. know, I mean, they would wear I, half the time they wear them, half the time they don't. Um, so we all wear them in my house. I have college and high school age sons. So I think we both have three boys. We share. Yeah, we do. Okay. That, yeah. I believe. yeah. Um, yeah. And I think my older sons especially think, oh well, I've got the blue light on my glasses. I'm good. <laughs> but then I know yeah, they yeah. both do have trouble sleeping sometimes. So it's really a combination. It's still preferable to make those lifestyle adjustments if possible, I think. But right. If, what I'm hearing you say when you need to be on your computer yes. or phone late, then try to implement some of those strategies. Absolutely. And you, even if uh, th even 30 minutes or 60 minutes of no light, right? Just get off your device you know, go, go read a book, go just, you know, do something else. Even that 30 minutes is, is again, better than nothing. So uh, anything you can do to just eliminate that light. Um, yeah. So. So I have yeah. a question. Mm -hmm. I'll read on, um, on a Kindle and put the background black and the words in the white and then dim it. Does I'm, it is dimmer for me, but is that still emitting a blue light that would mess up the rhythms? <laughs> It, it is, but nice things about Kindles, especially the, I guess, the, the, the higher end Kindles, they use a backlight, right? Or maybe they all do. So that light actually is not coming out at you. It's going down towards the, towards the screen itself. So uh, they'll, they'll, I think that is a better, um, better than using an iPad or some other form of device. I do think Kindles are likely better. Now, is there data on that? I, you know, is there actual studies on that? I don't, I don't think so. Looking at every device. But but just, it kind of makes sense that Kindles are more, um, you know, just better at minimizing that light exposure. For, okay, you know, so another so. question, um, going back to this 3 a.m. wake-up call and women around our age will be like, oh, it's hormones, it's my, the time of my life. So if they think that is happening, should they seek like their GP first or should they just go to you first? Can, can you, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, most uh, for most women. So yeah, I mean, if you have a, you might be a, your primary care doctor or your OB gin that you probably see regularly. I, you know, I mean, it really depends on how severe the disturbance is. A lot of times, if you go see them, they may end up referring out to a, a sleep specialist for the care. Um, but I think it largely depends on just how severe the problem is. If it's, you know, the, I guess the important part is knowing whether it's acute or chronic, right? If it's if it just started. It's usually much easier to manage by a, 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 a you know by a primary care physician, but once it becomes chronic and it's and then there's anxiety associated with not sleeping and all of those factors, then it, you you probably need a specialist to help you kind of figure out the right sleep hygiene and the behavioral methods and maybe you need a medication. 
Um, you know, we haven't talked about medications, but medications do play a role. Uh, they're not, they're not uh, generally speaking, they're not meant for long-term use. Um, but, you know, they, they are indicated in short-term situations, and there are specific reasons that we do use medications for sleep as well. So, um, And so we talked about uh, light. And you just mentioned sleep hygiene, and I think you're going to um, help provide us with an article in an upcoming um, article on invibelife.com to give some good sleep hygiene. And I think that's invaluable for people to go to and check out, but just, are there another one or two culprits you see, you know, light is one, I don't know, maybe that three o'clock Starbucks run. I mean, what, what else from a lifestyle perspective? Um, well, yes, a three o'clock Starbucks run is a guy like that. I like that one. <laughs> Caffeine, right? Uh, that's a big, yeah, that is a big one. Um, that's a big one. The other thing I want to mention really is when you talk about the three o'clock morning awakening, uh, particularly in women, one thing to remember is that we, and this goes back to our sleep apnea discussion earlier. Uh, sleep apnea is much more common in men than in women by, uh, by two to one. So it's much more common. However, however, uh, when women reach the perimenopausal age group, that risk becomes one to one. So basically, wow. the risk for sleep apnea doubles uh, in the perimenopause menopausal age frame time frame. Um, and the symptoms for women are very different from that of men. Men, you typically get the you know the snoring and the apnea and all the you know the gasping for air. Those are the symptoms you see in men. Women, uh, studies have shown over and over again that they actually present with insomnia. So their complaint is, I can't stay asleep. I'm waking up. Maybe they have night sweats, but they don't necessarily snore and gasp for air, which is the most obvious symptoms of sleep apnea. So uh, if you're in that, if you've never had a sleep disturbance and suddenly you develop a sleep disturbance in that time frame and you don't have any underlying other reasons that you can think of that would have triggered it, you know, increased stress or change in lifestyle, things like that. It's something to consider. And those are situations where a sleep study would be helpful in, in, you know, get, getting a better understanding of what's happening with your sleep. So, so what are some treatments mm-hmm. for sleep apnea? Right. Or, or, or any, other. What are some treatments? So, well, it, it really depends on the sleep disorder. Um, so if we're talking about, let's, well, let's talk about sleep apnea, at least briefly. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of CPAP or positive pressure therapy, right? It's a device that blows positive air pressure uh, through the nose or mouth that keeps the airway open. Highly effective, uh, works extremely well, but you got to wear this device every night when you go to bed. So there's a, they've gotten much better over the course of, you know, the last, you know, 18, 20 years that I've been practicing. Um, And so it is the most common treatment. Uh, there's also oral appliance devices. These are devices that you place in your mouth. Um, and what it does is it pulls your lower jaw forward. And by pulling your lower jaw forward, it helps keep your airway open m- to minimize snoring and to uh, reduce, you know, apneic episodes. Then there are surgical options. There's all sorts of surgeries. And I work with a lot of different surgeons, you know, ear, nose, and throat doctors that do surgery. Um, and so the surgical intervention is probably is, is not probably it is the least effective option um, for treating sleep apnea, and that largely has to do with just that you know that we just don't have a great uh, success rate with removing your uvula or uh, opening up your nose or things like that. They can help reduce the severity of the problem, but they don't work as well in terms of just eliminating the problem. Now there is a brand new surgical technique that just came out. It's called Inspire. And I'm working with ENTs who do this procedure. And it's actually like a pacemaker. It's a very, uh, very, it's literally, you know, it's very new. And what it does is it actually sends a nerve signal. Uh, it sends, it stimulates the nerves that push the tongue forward while you sleep to help keep your airway open. And so you actually have a pacemaker in, inserted in your chest and it has a lead that goes all the way up through your neck And then it stimulates the back of your neck to push that tongue forward to keep it open. Um, I had the opportunity to actually see that surgery with one of the ENT doctors that I work with just a few weeks ago. And we take care of them after they've had that surgery. So that's another option. Now, don't forget, weight, what is the number one risk factor for sleep apnea? Weight, right? It's not the only risk factor. But so, you know, losing weight is always going to be helpful for reducing sleep apnea, right? 
But it's also important to remember that about 50% of those who have sleep apnea are not overweight. So things like genetics play a large role. Age, yeah, it runs in families. I have marathon runners that we take care of that have severe sleep apnea. I mean, these guys, you know, they're in great shape, right? And they still have sleep apnea. Uh, Then you have age. As we get older, unfortunately, none of this gets better. Um, So the risk of sleep apnea goes up. Allergies, asthma, smoking history. Alcohol, uh, definitely alcohol. If you've had a few drinks before you go to bed, you're definitely more likely to not only have sleep apnea, but it's much more disruptive to your sleep. Alcohol suppresses your REM sleep. It suppresses your slow wave sleep. So, yeah, so I could go on and on about all the risk factors, but that's a kind of highlight on, on the big one. Yeah. It's funny that you say that about alcohol. I've had a girlfriend of mine one time said that she couldn't drink wine at night because she would wake. So mm-hmm. she- drinks, I don't know, it was a hard alcohol that she drinks instead of the wine. And I was like, that, I, I thought that was, an, I don't experiment enough to know the difference, but you know, well, maybe it's a sugar in the wine. I don't know. I, well, you know, alcohol is the, if you ask, uh, if you look at statistics, what is the number one sleep aid used in America for sleep? It's alcohol. What's the number one? You know, most, I mean, people will start, I mean, I've seen some, you know, you know, really crazy amounts of alcohol being consumed all with the intent of not enjoying the alcohol, just to sleep. So, um, and so if you drink enough of it, I'm sure it'll knock you out. Now the quality of that sleep you're getting is pretty, you know, poor is very poor. Um, and, and alcohol, by the way, talking about the 3am, 3am awakening, Alcohol is known to put you to sleep, mm-hmm. uh, but it wakes you up. Uh, and, in, and so the 3 a.m. awakening, if you've ever had a, too much to drink, uh, you're going to wake up much earlier just because that's what alcohol does is once it's kind of out of your system, you just kind of pop right up. So um, that's another trigger, at least. Yeah. yeah. I think that's good information to get out because I think a lot of people think, oh, couple yeah, glasses of wine and I'm going to relax. Yeah. 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 If you have a glass of wine with dinner and, and that's it, that's, I mean, you can't, yeah, that's fine. If you're using it, you think that it's going to help you sleep. That's not a good idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I almost find that if I have a glass of wine, I can't have it too late. Like I don't mm-hmm. like to have wine and then go lay down. I need to have those couple hours before between. dinner. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. At, least, at least we've got that yeah, going for us, Cheryl. Solitaire at 3 a.m. is not a good thing, but you know. Um, well, another thing that I noticed on your website, you mentioned the restless leg. I had oh, no wow. idea that was a sleep disorder. And, and I actually had it only when I was pregnant. So I yes. haven't had it before yep. or after, but it's such an unusual thing to happen. I felt like it was so bizarre to me. So can you talk more about it? Were you, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, were you able to just, uh, for you, Cheryl, were you able to, so you recognize that being restless legs because it is much more common during pregnancy. So it is a. I recognize that that's what it was. And knowing, you know what I do outside of my life. Yeah. I started doing before I went to bed every night was grabbing a foam roller and just rolling out my whole like my, all, my whole leg, my calves, my feet, thinking maybe this will help. Some nights it did, some nights it didn't, and who knows. But um, And I didn't know if there was any correlation because I didn't really know anything about restless leg, but I just knew that those pins and needles in my legs, that, that that's what it was. But I didn't, yeah, yeah. You know, I attributed it to how big I was getting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's really, you know why you had it? It's because of uh, hemo, it's basically iron deficiency. So when you're pregnant, you have, as you as you grow, of course, your iron count, you become what we call hemodiluted, which means your iron stores are the same, but there's a lot more fluid in circulation. So iron deficiency is a very common cause for uh, restless leg syndrome. Now, there are a lot of different causes again, but uh, that along with uh, one of the other actually very common causes is really, again, genetics. Uh, restless leg syndrome runs in families. If you have other family members that have it, you're much more likely to have it. Uh, of course, nicotine is a very common uh, trigger. Uh, alcohol, again, is a common trigger. Uh, uh, you know, and then uh, certain medications. A lot of people, you know, in today's world, a lot of people are taking antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. 
there's a certain group called SSRIs, you know, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're your Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Effexor. Uh, th- those group of medications are also known to trigger restless leg syndrome. Wow. Um, so antihistamines can trigger restless leg syndrome, uh, sy- uh, syndrome. So those are just some of the causes. Now, what are the symptoms, right? The most common is what you just described is, is an ex- ex- uncomfortable sensation in your legs. Um, and inter- you know, interestingly, it's a circadian disorder, meaning it occurs more commonly at night. Yeah. That is when you're most like a, right before you go to bed. In fact, it's a, it's a cause for insomnia. And this, there's a person laying in bed and they can't get comfortable. They're constantly shifting their legs back and forth until uh, they can get comfortable. So that's, that's the other one. Number two, movement should, or number three, really, movement should relieve the symptoms. So if you get up and walk around, usually the symptoms go away. If it doesn't, it's not restless leg syndrome. So that's the other thing to remember. It's movement relief symptoms. And of course, stimulation, uh, hot baths, using, like you said, a hot roller, anything to massage those legs will at least temporarily relieve the symptoms, not permanently, depending on how severe your situation is. Um, That's what restless leg syndrome is. Now, of course, there are medications that we use to treat restless leg syndrome uh, that are highly effective, that work actually quite well. Um, so it's, you know, it is a treatable condition. There's something we call dopamine agonist. Um, there's another medication called GABA, gabapentin is a common medication we use to treat restless leg uh, symptoms as well. But always the, the, really the focus is first figure out what's causing it. And if it's something you can change with your lifestyle, uh, diet, things like that, that's always the goal. But if you can't, or if there is no other cause for it, that's when usually medications will be, you know, a good option for it. Um, yeah, outside, outside of pregnancy, how common is that? Uh, we, you know, it is, it is actually quite common. Again, the majority of people that have it are, are undiagnosed, but estimates show that anywhere from about five to 7% of the population has some degree of restless leg sim- symptoms. Okay. Again, it varies. Uh, it does tend to get worse as we get older. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, and a lot of people that come to us don't even know, they have it, it's usually diagnosed as some part of an anxiety disorder or, you know, uh, you know, med- it could be related to their alcohol use or something else before, you know, before we really get down to figuring out what it is. Yeah, so, it's, it, um, it was com- very, very uncomfortable. It is, it is. It was, I, so I just can't imagine having that on a regular basis. Like I, I didn't have it before and I never had it after. So I now... I don't even know if I had it with both pregnancies, but um, it, it, I just can't imagine having that on a regular basis. That's just, you know, I guess it would be, I guess that's when people would really need to seek your help. And I can understand then if it got so bad and you couldn't find any solutions, that medication is definitely something that you would more than willing to be able, you know, take to help resolve yeah. that. And so, your primary care, uh, sorry. You're, Oh, no. I was going to just say. Oh, that's okay. No, I was just going to say primary care physicians are got you know they can treat restless leg syndrome much more effective. You know they're at least first line. It's always good to go to your primary care doctor, get that. You know if you if you have the symptoms, those medications you know really they can prescribe or we can prescribe. We really tend to see more of the treatment resistant patients, and there are a host of different. Uh, I could, we could speak uh, quite a bit on just this, but there's all different sorts of medications we use that are beyond what maybe a primary care doctor would use to treat, treat the condition. So, so for you, can do people go into your office and spend the night there to get tested or can people do that from home? How does that work? The testing, yeah, two types of tests. Uh, the in-lab test is called a, po- a polysomnogram. So a polysomnogram is a test where you come spend the night in the sleep lab and it's a very thorough test. So we're measuring everything from brain activity to eye movements, to muscle tone, to your heart, to your breathing patterns, to your limb movements. Uh, so you have a lot of, you know, you have a lot of things attached to you. None of it's painful, but there are a lot of leads attached to you. And we have staff overnight who, who are, of course, trained. And their job is to gather the data, which I then look at the following morning. Um, and that test is used to diagnose uh, mostly sleep apnea. We use it 
uh, for different types of sleep apnea. Now, we haven't gotten into a discussion about obstructive sleep apnea versus central sleep apnea. There are different types of sleep apnea, but uh, we tend to use it more for those who are sicker. You know, those that have underlying cardiovascular disease, um, you know, th th those who are obese or, or significantly obese, uh, have pulmonary disease. That's where an in-lab test is, is much more helpful. Now, the other test is a home sleep study. And a home sleep study, there are a lot of different types. They are, they measure fewer parameters. They, they measure, for example, there are ones that measure, uh, you have a cannula that measures airflow. You have a little pulse oximeter that measures your pulse. And then you have one belt around your chest. Uh, and that's it. And, and we, people will come pick them up from the office. They'll take them home, uh, to use them. And, uh, so that can be done in the comfort of your home. Now, the, the, the upside is it's easier to do. The downside is, you're not getting as much data, but in individuals who are healthy otherwise, and uh, really you're just looking for sleep apnea, and, and then it's a perfectly fine test. And we, we do, you know, we particularly with COVID and all the restrictions with, you know, we are doing in lab tests again now, but our our home test vol you know, volume went up significantly with COVID just because it's just safer uh, to do those tests at home. And so, you know, so both really have their pros and cons, um, but home testing is always, is a very, very reasonable option. Uh, you know, if you're just not wanting to, you know, be, be even ship the whole test devices to people's homes, there's some new devices that are just coming out that are actually even simpler to use. So, you know, getting tested should not be a barrier anymore because it's, it's really gotten quite convenient these days. It doesn't sound as intimidating as I thought. It would be right. Yeah, I mean, the most common. I work with a lot of physicians, and one of the most common reasons they tell me that people don't want to come see me is because they're like, they don't want to spend a night in the sleep lab. You know, they don't want to come sleep there. They just assume that that's what's going to happen. That's not reality of what's going to happen, but you know, that's their assumption. And uh, you know, so we, you know, once we see them and we decide, they're always seen in consultation first. And once they've been seen, we can decide, you know, what test is better. And of course, if the home test is better, that's what we're going to do. So they're easier. So. Is this also a barrier is thinking, oh, if, if my husband gets that machine on his face, is that machine going to be so loud that it keeps me up at night? Uh, good question. Yeah, not anymore. Now, maybe 20 years ago, uh, you know, uh, you know, CPAP, like any technology, has come an extremely long way. Now there are CPAP devices you could put in your pocket almost. I mean, that's how small they've gotten, you know? So, you know, for people that I see that travel, they like the very, very small. I mean, they're no bigger than a, than your phone, really, maybe a little thicker and a little longer, but they're very, very small. Um, and they do not, to answer your question, no, these days they are whisper quiet. I mean, you can't even tell they're on, they're that quiet. Like you have to actually put your ear up to the device to hear them. So they've gotten, and as I always tell people, it's better than listening to your partner snore all night long. Correct. You have to walk <laughs> <with that. laughs> correct. correct. <laughs> Definitely. I think this has been very informative. I feel like, um, I hope that we are helping to get the word out because it seems to me, you know, we talk a lot about balance and wellness that sleep is such a critical part of it. And that, you know, I hope that our audience and others out there yeah. recognize that. It's as important as exercise and eating right. And we talk about meditation and all that stuff here at MMI Blood. I feel like sleep is, it is just as important, if not more important mm -hmm. than some of those things. Because when you don't have good sleep, I mean, yeah. it, it makes for a really bad day. Mm -hmm. If you think about, yeah. you know, when you don't Absolutely. Sleep. Yeah, I mean, just this is what the, you know. One thing I'd really uh, want to mention is, you know, sleep deprivation, right? Just dedicating, you know, we're, we're we should be spending a third of our lives, if you really look at it, sleeping, right, eight hours a night. Um, but society has progressed to the point where, over the course of the last fifty, sixty years, the average American is getting sixty to ninety minutes of less sleep than they did, you know, well, fifty years ago. Why? Because of all these other things that we're doing and electronics and time and, you know, our lifestyles. And the easiest thing, the easiest thing to give up is sleep time wise, right? You can't give up your job. You can't give up caring for your children. You can't give up your relationships. You don't want to give up your social life. So what's the easiest thing to give up? It's sleep. But there are consequences. And that, 
we have learned so much about that over the course of the last just even 10 years. You're more likely to, simple things, obviously you're more likely to have a poor quality life, but you're more likely to gain weight. You're more likely to have diabetes. You're more likely to have heart disease. And so, you know, and, and current studies show that we're, we're at the point where almost 40%, if not 50% of Americans are chronically sleep deprived. So if there's one thing I would tell people, if there's nothing else, is you've got to, assuming you have no underlying sleep disorder, you've got to dedicate time to sleep. Now, the other great part is you don't, if you, if you can, if you're like, you know, if you're busy and, you know, you're busy and you only have so X amount of hours, you can only sleep for five hours at night. But, you know, in the afternoon or late evening or what, or even early evening, you can get another out. Now, again, I don't know how often that actually happens, but you can, you can get, you can get, you know, get, get enough sleep. If as long as you get that eight hours uh, within that 24 hour time period, that's what's important. Uh, a 20 minute nap is better than no nap. You yeah. know, that's. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm also a big advocate of the 20 minute nap. I'll often tell my kids because I'll and worked, 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 and then they come home and we do a little bit, but then I'm like, okay, guys, I need 20 minutes. And yeah. I'll just set a timer for 20 minutes. And, and literally, mm-hmm. after those 20 minutes, I feel so much I better. Mm-hmm. And it just. Yes, it makes the rest of the evening go better. Where I don't feel like I'm just tired the rest of the evening. You know, if I get too tired in the evening, we order out way too much food. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a consequence. That's not as good food, right? <laughs> you know, right? It's not as like, healthy. Yeah. And all of the other. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that, Cheryl? What I said you never had my cooking. It might be better to order out. <laughs> I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's great. So yeah, no, but I really think yeah, sleep got to focus on getting enough sleep. Uh, It's better than drinking a cup of coffee. It's better than the energy drinks. Uh, I mean, the number of people I see coming in on ridiculous amounts of caffeine drinking energy drinks is, is just amazing that, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's really, I I mean, it's just a lot, you know, and these energy drinks, one can of energy drinks, some of them have like the equivalent of four or five cups of coffee in them. It's ridiculous. I mean, like, you know, 300 milligrams of caffeine, you know, a cup of coffee is like 80 to 90 milligrams of caffeine. So you have like three to four times as much caffeine. So, uh, you know, yeah, so there, there is. Uh, We've almost what, been made to feel guilty or lazy if we complain about not sleeping enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's society. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Definitely. You know, it's funny, Definitely. you know, I have, uh, this is very, this hasn't happened recently, but I've actually had uh, people come in to see me. They go, Doc, I'm busy. I got a lot happening. Teach me how to get less sleep. And I'm like, I'm I'm not the right guy for you. I don't, I don't have a miracle. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to do that. But uh, and you know, you have to educate these people. These are like these Type A people. Yeah, They're just going, going, going. And that, yeah, and that's the society we live in. Is this? How can you do? How can you do more with less? Yeah. And the reality is, you can't. You know, we're human, you know, we, we're, we're all the same in so many ways. There is no shortcut. There are no shortcuts. If there was, wouldn't it be nice? Oh, I only need to sleep three hours. Think how much I'd get done in a day. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And so we've covered a lot of topics so far, but are there any other conditions or um, trends you're seeing that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah. So one of the uh, other common sleep disorders that we see in the clinic quite often is uh, narcolepsy. And the general term is, the medical term is hypersomnia. So hypersomnia just means excessive daytime sleepiness. And one form of of excessive daytime sleepiness is narcolepsy. And uh, narcolepsy is a neurologic sleep disorder. It's basically where the brain doesn't produce enough of the awake transmitters um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's an autoimmune disorder. It affects mainly, it's more common in women than in men, and it usually presents itself in adolescence. So these are very, very sleepy young women and of course men, and, uh, they have, they're just unable to, it doesn't matter how much sleep they get at night. It doesn't matter what they do, but they're, they're just chronically, uh, sleepy. And so they have difficulty functioning. They have difficulty driving. So that's another common disorder. The other one is what we call circadian rhythm disorders, where there's a biologic, say a biologic misalignment with your normal circadian function, 
Um, the most common, one of the most common is what we see in teenagers is called a delayed sleep phase where they have difficulty falling asleep. They have no issues of quality of sleep. So as long as they're able to get their eight hours of sleep, they're perfectly fine. But you'll typically see this in, uh, in high school kids or in college kids where they're going to bed at you know, three or four in the morning and then they can't get up for class, right? But if, if you allow them to sleep till 10 a.m., they're perfectly fine. You know, they'll, they get their eight hours and they feel pretty good. Um, there's something, then shift workers, you know, we see millions, there's millions of Americans who are shift workers. Uh, they work overnight shifts. So of course, you're fighting your normal biologic drive night after night, right? And so it's not normal to work shifts. And so there are ways to manage that, whether that's, you know, behavioral with good sleep hygiene, sleep routine, and of course, medications, again, are indicated in individuals who work shifts. Um, then there's other types of, then, you know, the other big one is parasomnias. What is a parasomnia? It's anyone that acts out during sleep. So we, we have, you know, sleepwalking, like sleep eating, yeah. sleep eating. Uh, we've seen it all. You sleep, anything sleep related is called a parasomnia any behavior. And so there are a lot of different causes for parasomnias. Um, but sleep deprivation, as we spoke earlier, is actually one of the most common triggers for sleepwalking. So if someone comes in sleepwalking, the first thing you do is make sure that they're getting enough sleep. Now, there are other causes, but uh, uh, and certain medications can trigger sleepwalking. You know, I'm sure most these days, most people are aware of Ambien. Ambien, you know, induces sleepwalking. It can, that can happen. And so that's something else to keep in mind as well. And so you mentioned the teenagers and college kids. Mm -hmm. What would you say the typical patient you have is? The typical age? Is it more men, more women? Who comes in to see you? So by far, the most common age group uh, is definitely in the 40 to 60 range, right? That's when you're going to see the one for the sleep apnea being the most common sleep disorder we treat. That's the age group at which it presents, right? And so that by far is the largest age group. The excessively sleepy uh, people that we see that are younger are usually the hypersomnia or the idio what we call you know narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia group. Those are going to be a younger age group. And then, of course, we see the, the elderly, the 70 and 80, that's probably the next group. And that group, it's usually because they have underlying uh, cardiovascular disease, they have other medical problems, and their sleep disturbance is a contributing factor. So I, work, I probably work with more cardiologists than any other group of physicians, largely, oh, wow. because cardiovascular disease, heart disease. Uh, I mean, everything, heart attacks, heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, all of it is related to underlying sleep apnea. Now, of course, there's lots of other reasons for that. But in most of these patients, you have to pretty much these days, you have to at least rule out sleep disordered breathing, sleep apnea as a cause of that. So that's our you know, elderly, middle aged to elderly population that we're going to see. Um, so those kind of breaking down the age groups. Yeah. So I guess what my takeaway is, don't settle for the poor sleep or don't just assume, oh, it's just because, you know, I have young kids or it's just because I'm, you know, entering menopause or whatever it is, there can be help and absolutely yeah. go seek it. Get, get help. Yeah. If you're, if you're seeking, if you're having symptoms, yeah, definitely seek help. Um, you know, one thing that's really helpful is a sleep diary. Yeah, if, if no one's, if you've never done one, there's some on our website you can download and take a look at. But a sleep diary is a great way to gauge your sleep. It's very simple to do. You do it in the morning. It'll ask you simple questions. What time did you go to bed? How long did it take you to go to sleep? How many hours of sleep did you get? How do you feel in the morning? And what that does is by doing a sleep diary over the course of, let's say, two or three weeks, you get a good sense, like, how, what is my quality of sleep? Does it vary from day to day? Um, are weekends better? You know, if, if the weekend sleep quality is better, you already have your answer, which is or more than likely you're not getting enough sleep during the week, right? So those types of, and that helps us too, actually. If you bring in those sleep diaries when we see uh, you, you know, that's very helpful to help understand what, what's happening and what's going on in your sleep. Now, so there, there was you know, just... One message you wanted to send everyone out there, what would it be? Get more sleep. Mm -hmm. awesome. Get more sleep because it is, forget the sleep disorders, forget, oh, I mean, all, I mean, those are also extremely common and, and yes, they need to be treated. But if, if you could just focus on getting more sleep, um, that alone would make 
a huge difference for the majority of the population. And then, and then the behavioral, I guess the second thing would be follow good sleep hygiene, follow good sleep routine. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it seems basic, but sometimes as we were talking earlier, you just have to review that information um, and just, just, just be aware of it. Just doing those things will make a big difference in terms of ensuring, you know, that you feel more rested and you're more productive and you have a better quality of life. Uh, well, and so well, again, we will we will put those suggestions and tips up on our website as well for the good sleep hygiene. And I think, you know, give yourself permission. Understand yes. it's okay to take care of yourself. And this is a big part of it. So, so one thing we like to ask agreed. before we wrap mm-hmm. up is what do yeah. you do in your personal life to bring more balance to your day or to your life in general? What do I do? Um, well, I exercise regularly. That's a big component of it. I do get enough sleep, or at least I make up sleep. Now, am I guilty of not getting enough sleep from time to time? Absolutely, right? Um, but you can also compensate for not getting enough sleep. Uh, you know, actually, this is an interesting point. A lot of people will get a little more sleep on the weekends, right? Because you're uh, ho- hopefully you are. If you're not getting enough sleep during the week, you're getting a little more sleep during the weekend. That's perfectly fine. Sleep in, get that extra hour or two of sleep. But uh, yeah, good, a good diet, a good exercise. You know, it's all the basics. And uh, try to, you know, mental health is so important. So with the, particularly right now with everything happening. So uh, meditation, I do some yoga from time to time, a little meditation from time to time. Uh, all of that is really uh, extremely helpful in keeping a balanced life. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think this has been very much mm-hmm. uh, the questions answered that we know our audience has been asking us. I think you answered their questions today and hopefully that we've got enough information out there. We're going to link your article. We're going to link um, your, your website. website and so that people can yep. find you. Appreciate that. Um, but thank you again. Thank you for coming on. And we yeah, really yeah, we appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, I'm, uh, Amy. Yeah, Cheryl. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been great. Appreciate it. It's our thank pleasure. You. Thank you for listening to the In Vibe Life podcast. For more information and to join our community, be sure and check out our website at www.invibelife.com. We look forward to sharing with you.